pleasure to introduce our speaker again today, Dr. Eric Henricks from St. Louis, who I consider the foremost Scandinavian expert in the entire St. Louis region. Uh, he is president of the Danish Club of St. Louis and a strategic intelligence analyst with the American Military University. He's also a member of the Swedish Council of St. Louis, the Viking Club of St. Louis, the Norwegian Society of St. Louis, and the American Scandinavian Foundation. He is certified as a level three systems engineer by the Defense Acquisition University and as a NATO electronics warfare instructor. Dr. Henricks is the author of 18 books on Nordic languages, European politics, and economics. His books include 500 Years of Viking Presence in America, published in 2014, and Bronze Age Norse and Vikings in the World, 3,000 Years of Linguistics and Scientific Evidence, published earlier this year. He's giving three presentations at Missouri Southern today. This is the second one. Uh, this hour's topic is Scandinavians Were Everywhere, the First Global Travelers. At one o'clock, he'll be talking about the changing demographics of Scandinavia. I see in the audience we have a few members of the Ozarks Scandinavian Society of Springfield including the president. Uh, Roy, would you stand up and show them your attractive shirt? Hi, uh, actually it's Ray, Ray, Ray. Wormwood as the president. This is Roy, he's another member here. And um, so yeah, we have the Ozark Scandinavian Society of Springfield, Missouri, we meet once a month. And so if any of you would be interested in joining us, we're our first meeting, we don't meet in the summer, we have a, a midsummer fest and then we have a Yule fest at Christmas time, but um, so our first meeting uh, picking up is, um, is uh, this next Tuesday, a week from tomorrow. If any of you would like to come and join us, we're going to have a present. We have a presenter each time, and this time it's a lady who, uh, I think she was 24 when she migrated from uh, Sweden to America. She met an American serviceman and married him and ended up here. So she's going to be talking about that at our meeting next Tuesday. And Dr. Roy knows about an art exhibit at the Springfield Art Museum, if you want to mention that. You may not have heard of a fellow named Anders Zorn. He was a, he did a lot of etchings and he's Scandinavian. I think he's Norwegian. Swedish. 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 Somebody said Swedish. Yeah. Okay, good. And uh, we have a large collection of his work at the uh, art museum in Springfield, Missouri. And so it's periodically uh, put out uh, for exhibits. And so. Uh, I'm giving the information to your art department here so that we maybe can make a connection and maybe it will appear over here someday. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Roy, and thank you, Ray. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. David Adams, a retired history professor from Missouri State in Springfield. Glad to see so many people making the trip over this morning. Uh, but without further ado, let's welcome doc, Dr. Eric Hinrich to the stage. Thank you very much. Hi. Yes, I'm broadcasting. Okay, very good. Well, it's good to see so many faces here. Uh, I wanted to, because of popular interest, to advertise our little Scandinavian uh, picnic. We bring all four Scandinavian clubs in the St. Louis area together. The Viking Club, the Danish Club, the Swedish Club, and Norwegian Club. So you're all invited. I know it's a long trip, because I did it yesterday, yeah, okay? But if you happen to be in that area, uh, you're certainly welcome to come. We also have the past president of the Danish Club sitting here, who has come all the way from Washington, Missouri, and his lovely wife, Lee, where did she go? She might find a parking space. Okay, this is not easy. I went through this this morning without my permit. I understand. Okay, but this, this is uh, uh, Mr. Colin, Ben Colin, and he's the past president too. So uh, we hope to uh, make a good connection with the Scandinavians in the Ozark area too in the future and do some cross-pollinization. Um, if anybody's interested in, the, in this picnic, go to the, you guys are all, 
very computer literate. I know your generation. I used to teach you for a while, not even teaching me. But uh, go to this Norwegian Society website, Scandinavia of St. Louis, Danish Society. Just go to the Danish Club of St. Louis, and it's all advertised, all the information, if you're up there in that area, okay? And, uh, okay, so I wanted that information to be put out. Uh, first of all, it's a very ambitious uh, undertaking here. I have 210 slides. I made it through 62. Okay, so what I've offered everybody here, there, there's a, quite a, a few different interests here that I've noticed. Some of the club members are interested in their personal genealogy. Some people, if you get into genealogy, very quickly get into history. If you get into history, you get into language, depending on the depth you want to go. And so I have a wide range of subject matter. What I'm trying to say is I'm not going to be able to cover it all, but you're going to get a great big dose of it in a PDF file for anybody who wants it. Okay. I can see in this crowd here about 20 master's degrees thesis and about 10 doctorates coming out of this on a silver platter. So listen up and ask me for information because I'm handing the baton off to the next generation. That's the way I look at this, okay? So take me up on that. If you're interested, give me your email address. I'll make sure you get the PDF file. Okay, now back to... We're gonna talk about languages now a little bit more. Uh, I see uh, quite a few... Uh, uh, Oriental faces here. I see faces from China, and uh, it's unfortunate you missed the first part because I talked a little bit about the origins of Scandinavians. It's now been definitively established that it's, they're from Asia. Okay, what was thought to be mythology is actually history, and maybe I'll get into a little bit of it if I have time. So that should be of interest to you. Plus, some Indo-European languages which were thought to, to uh, they call them Indo-European, okay? But they originated in Western Europe. Then they went to India, and then they created uh, an extinct language which has been documented in China. That's how extensive this network of languages is. Now let's see if I can get back to uh, languages specifically. Uh, Uh, a lot of this has to do with travel, the widespread uh, travel of Scandinavians and their extent throughout the world. Uh, and you can detect it from uh, language study. And I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the influence on North American Indians. Okay. And uh, that, that's a uh, subject that has not been too well uh, known until recently. We'll get you there. I guarantee you're going to get a lot of information here. Okay. It turns out, as we were discussing in the first, uh, first hour, that there were travels to, uh, from essentially Greenland, the Greenland, uh, you could call them Vikings. After the year 1000, you could call them Vikings, okay, for a short time, okay. The Viking Age is really only a small part of this history, okay. It started with the invasion of Lindisfarne Monastery in Northern England, which is rather brutal, and continued on until about 1066 in England when finally uh, the Danes were and the English combined armies were defeated and uh, at Stamford Bridge. They still celebrate that there. The English are very aware of their Viking ancestry, okay? Uh, York was the center of their uh, civilization, Rerik in uh, Viking language. And uh, there's an annual celebration every year that was brought up, uh, the Rebil, the Rebil celebration. It's the largest 4th of July celebration outside of, of America, of the United States. And uh, the curator of that event claims that George Washington is a descendant of those Vikings from York, or Rutterovic. That's an interesting thing to study. I haven't f f fully studied that, but that's another interesting area, okay? 
Now, what happened was uh, when the, uh, Eric the Red first went to um, uh, Greenland, he was basically banished. He was a bad guy. He uh, killed people. In those days, your punishment for killing people was you're banished. You know, they didn't hang you, electrocute you. So he went and established a, uh, a uh, stronghold or a settlement at the nicest fjord on the western coast of Greenland called Ratalit, okay, which is still there today. And by the way, there's about 800 ruins of Vikings in uh, Greenland, southern Greenland, most of them. But they go all the way up to, uh, to beyond Tula. Tula is 850 miles from the North Pole. I was stationed up there, and I got a lot of uh, information about the Greenland Vikings there. But eventually, there was a, we talked about it earlier, there was a little ice age, okay? In other words, it got too cold, okay? Crops didn't grow anymore. The, uh, the Vikings really started in the year 1000 when Eric the Red's wife became a Christian. And uh, he didn't, he, he remained a heathen. Their marriage wasn't very successful after that, but uh, they did sire uh, Leif Erikson. They, in Iceland, they have the birthplace of uh, Leif Erikson there as a monument to him. They think they know he came from Erikstadir. And uh, so they know their history quite well. But there were numerous excursions beyond the year 1000 uh, until about the last record was 1408 A.D. There was a marriage in uh, Greenland. Okay. Now these records are impeccably restored by the Catholic Church. These were Catholic Vikings, if you will. We call them Christian Vikings, but they were actually Catholic because there was no Reformation then. There was no change in religion. And it was well documented. Not only were there, were there uh, uh, marriages and baptisms documented, but things like number of ships that went to Labrador to bring w w timber back. They, they didn't have much timber in Greenland. They didn't have hardly any in, in, in Iceland anymore. It was overcrowded and they cut all the trees down. But anyway, this is, it was well documented in, in uh, Vatican archives. If any of you ever get a chance to get into the Vatican, it'll be very revealing to you. There's some people who get in there for research purposes, you know. And if you do, you will find out some interesting things because they have collective history of a couple thousand years of interesting history. So there was a long period of time where the Vikings, after year 1000, flourished in uh, Greenland, but the weather got colder and colder. The crops didn't grow. The Catholic Church still required them to pay their, th their tithes, 10% of their income. And they moved out in mass. Okay, I may have time to show you a map of how they did that, but the point is they did leave, and they what they their first settlement was in uh, Newfoundland, and that was discovered in 1961 by Norwegian uh, uh, researchers, archaeologists. Okay, and since so this is on, on language, my overall presentation contains. Norse influence in a whole lot of cultures, okay? The Norse, for example, in Normandy, okay? The Normans were the ones that invaded uh, England and ultimately conquered them and changed their language. That's why we have so many French words. It's easy to learn French and English. You can speak a French English or an Anglo-Saxon English. You can talk about my, my spouse or you can talk about my wife, my wife. Anyway. Everywhere they went, Russia, okay, Normandy, Greenland, they left their, England of course. I, I collected a, a dictionary myself of about 900 words that are Norse in the English language, okay. And we'll see some examples. Now this is really old stuff here. This is taking a dead language, okay, a dead language, I guess I got to turn this on, don't I? These are Algonquin languages, the, the first part here. Skew, skew, sometimes pronounced shu in, our, in our Norwegian, but skew, okay. This is Algonquin. The next one, araka. Araka is almost 
completely understandable to us, okay, as or aka. It was oraka, oraka, or and a field, aka. We get the word acre from aka. This is a Norse word, okay. And or is a, as you can see, it's it's a Icelandic acre and uh, akir, and so it's common to all these cultures. Orasikit, orasikit. Okay, or once again is a river, and sik is Old English. As I can see, and Sika, okay, a small stream. Well, Orasika in Old Norse really means a shallow river, which is a little stream, right? The next one is Oraskagwa, Oraskalk, okay. This is almost completely understandable from modern Swedish. Or skug, Orskug, Orasagwa. Now, these, these, Translations come from Chapman's book, written in the 1940s, and he, he, he studied these Algonquin languages. There's, there's less than 2,000 speakers of these Algonquin languages today. It's very hard to do this research, okay? The, uh, of those 2,000, there's only about 10% that are monolingual and only speak one language. But if you want to do research, this is the kind of stuff you get documents out of, okay? And uh, esoteric stuff. But first, get a degree where you can make a living. But then, do like I do. Then study this stuff when you get a little older. You know, it's very interesting, okay? But uh, there is so much evidence in place names. Place names that are thought to be uh, North American Indian are actually have Norse roots, okay? The next example, oh, by the way, there's been 2,000 of these identified uh, in Algonquin languages. 2,000 words in Algonquin languages that have Norse roots, if not almost completely Norse. The ones I'm showing here are almost completely Norse, you know. Uh, not only if, if researchers determine this in North America, but a Mexican woman researcher in Mexico City has come up with the same conclusion. I was astounded when I first came across this. Okay, place names particularly. Okay, here's a Kanarasit, Shana or Kana first, a recognized tract of land, okay, is the Old Norse equivalent. Sherbukt, that is almost exactly modern Swedish. Sherbukt, Sherbukt, Sherbukt. It's Sherbukt, now this is they call it Halifax today, but that's the uh, Indian name for Halifax. Lakavana. That's another one. Lakavana. This sounds really cute. Well, Lakavana. Low, shallow water. Icelandic, Laugvatn. Swedish, Lugvatn. Okay. These are just some of the 2,000 examples. Moccasin, moccasins. Okay. Moccasin, his pair is what it means, like a pair of shoes, okay? Or a couple, a man and a wife. Mimaka, okay? In addition to that, at the bottom of the chart, you see about the Mandan Indians. This, to me, is one of the most uh, interesting places to do your research. But unfortunately, the Mandan Indians came all the way from the East Coast. They were pushed across the United States, first to Ohio, and they finally wound up in uh, North Dakota, and uh, they had all the characteristics of uh, European civilization, to include their physical looks. They were, uh, they didn't have photographs, there, but they had a, a Swiss artist that went there and painted them, and it's astounding the way they looked. They didn't look like the rest of North American Indians. Their civilization was, was founded based on, they built little towns with streets, okay, they were agrarian society, they didn't go hunting buffaloes like people did in those days. They had a different society altogether. Unfortunately, the Mandan Indians were uh, decimated by uh, smallpox, okay? And uh, many of the Europeans came in with diseases, uh, and this is a problem today, uh, with widespread uh, immigration, we're encountering a lot more diseases we never had before. I understood that 
polio is resurging now in the United States, you know, in different diseases. Well, it decimated the Mandans. But there was one lady left in 1971 who's Mandan, pure Mandan. They did some interbreeding with other Indian tribes, Shoshone, and uh, the people who discovered this were none other than our famous uh, Missourians, Lewis and Clark, because they went up the Missouri River to the source and they recorded extensively information about the Mandan Indians. We have a museum in St. Charles, Missouri that documents this, but uh, Sacagawea was able to translate between the Shoshona and the, uh, the Mandan Indians there, and they're trying to revive that language, a dead language. And people say, well, you can't do it. Wrong answer. Hebrew was dead. The Hebrew language was dead for 3,000 years. It was revived. It can be done, OK? Especially today with the resources you have on the internet. OK. Uh, there's some more examples. I want to get into a little bit more modern languages now. Okay, just to tell you though that study old maps too. That's a part of this research. There's a lot of old maps. So these are the kind of the maps that the Vatican had. This one's from 1569. But the very tiny print up there, even though I'm almost blind without my reading glasses, it says Alba. Okay, those are Albans from uh, Scotland. Okay, that were driven out by the Vikings. And they just went to Greenland on the way to get out of their own, get out of Dodge, is what they did, and it kept on going. Okay, so you can learn a lot from old maps on this research. <coughs> they, they first of all they went to the Orkney Islands, Shetland Islands, and then they went on, and they had these kind of boats. And we talked a lot about those boats earlier. Uh, there was a warming period then, and you could actually go all the way through the. Uh, Northwest Passage, all the way, I had a, I've got a map of that too. Uh, but the Northwest Passage allowed you to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean with small boats. Okay, when we get around, I'll show you that, that map. Um, to show you that it can be done because of global warming, in 2003, the uh, Russians sent a tanker all the way through. And in the last hour, we're going to talk about that the Russians are very interested in the Arctic because it's loaded with gas and oil. People will say, that's a bunch of ice up there. There's, there can't be anything there. It's hard to believe and conceive that used to be a tropical jungle up there. Okay? Things have changed in the history. Okay? And there's so much uranium and oil resources under the Arctic. And the Russians are exploiting it, and we'll talk about that. That's one of the potential sources of conflict as oil supplies become scarcer. Okay. For reference, you might want to look at some of these. These are the actual names of the Vikings used for the different parts in Europe. The interesting one is Cirque Serkland, sometimes called Sarkland. Serk is the shirt, okay? To, to wear something is to bear something. To bear a shirt, berserk. That's what they call the Vikings when they went into a battle. They went berserk. They bore a shirt, okay? Serkland is short land, or shirt land, okay? And why did they, why, did they, why were they so ferocious? Because they ate flugswamp. Flugswamp is a, is a red mushroom with white dots on it. And the, the Germans think it's so cute and they use it for decoration, it's hallucinatory, you know. So they went into, into battle and they call them the Sark. But it was really it was something quite simple. They wore a shirt, you know. Anyway, that's a digression. That's the kind of interesting things you run into. Okay. There's more discussion of, I'm not going to go through all these comparisons of the, uh, the Algonquin languages, just to tell you that there is something called a Malam Arum, sometimes called a Walamulum. This is an ancient uh, Algonquin uh, hieroglyphic, if you will, okay? And it describes exactly what I'm talking about, how their ancestors came from Greenland, walked over the frozen sea during that little ice age. They literally walked 
to North America. Okay, and they, they documented this with pictograms. Okay, as far as North American Indians and uh, Nordic interaction go, I am convinced that it's just, there's too much of a coincidence that you could have 2,000 words of Nordic origin. Now, people say, well, maybe there were, you know, millions of North American Indians. Well, it's not true. They were fragmented in the smaller groups. Anne Stein, one of the researchers from Norway, says the original four or 5,000 uh, Viking Catholics or Viking Christians that left Greenland, she said after a couple hundred years in North America, they constituted populations of 40,000. Well, when they, what they did is they stayed in their little concentration, just like today. It's like, this is the Viking ghetto, and this is the Mi'kmaq ghetto. You know, people didn't mix that much, but it's the same phenomenon. So what happened is when they did mix, you had relative proportions of DNA, which is the tool right now that corroborates all this history. DNA analysis, okay? So you can find with roughly the same number of Nordics and, uh, and uh, Vikings, if you will, uh, intermarrying. And so my, my conclusion is that after looking at this, and you haven't seen all the evidence, but once again, if, if any of you researchers, young researchers, or old researchers, it's better for the old researchers. It keeps their mind active, you know. We keep stimulating the neural growth, you know. Okay. And for the American Medical Association, I have to make this plug. It says, if you learn a foreign language as an adult, and let me tell you, it's difficult. It's, my kids, I taught them three languages before they're 10. It was no problem for them. But if you take up a foreign language now as an adult, and you really master it, it will delay dementia or Alzheimer's by five years. Okay? That's the American Medical Association. So, learn languages. That's what we're talking about here. Okay? Now, the question is, what if you learn five languages? Can you delay it by 30 years? Uh, other things tend to... I could tell you about red light therapy, too. I'm going through it right now. This is just an excursion. You know, I shouldn't even bring this up. But that's the book I'm working on now. But red light therapy regenerates nerves for people with neuropathy, which I have. I have some neuropathy, okay? It actually causes nerves to grow and regenerate. And American Medical Association doesn't know this by and large. But my conclusion is, if you can regenerate nerves in your feet, your head is full of neurons. So I'm putting it on my head recently. It also so, so supposedly helps you grow hair too. So some of us men might be interested, might not. Red light therapy, hot tip. Okay, that's, that's for the next presentation. The DNA is the most powerful tool. Okay, the language is important. Uh, Christianity uh, changed the nature of the warlike Vikings. Uh, this lady over here, Patricia Sutherland, she found just hundreds, hundreds of uh, Viking artifacts in the North Arctic, Northern Canada, the Arctic, Canadian Arctic, okay? And uh, she used to be praised. I know she have a Sutherland's down here for home remodeling too. So that should trigger your memory down here. I wrote, drove by it today. Sutherland, Sudada, okay? Now, you also have some, some allies up in Knox, City, Missouri. They got a Viking club up there. Okay. We have a Viking club also in St. Louis, if you're interested in this. I was minding my own business, you know, nice, happy retiree. And I joined this Viking club and I got interested in all this stuff. And it's, it hasn't stopped yet. Okay. So look at the websites if you're interested in this kind of stuff. And uh, my presentations are covering a very broad swath of history language, culture, and uh, it's too much to give you in one presentation. So now we'll get down to the more recent developments, okay, in, the, in these languages. There, in the Norwegian languages, uh, really you could consider Norwegian as more or less the mother language, okay, of the modern, modern. Uh, and the reason, 
of the modern Scandinavian languages. Now here, here's the first problem you encounter, okay? Even though Norwegian, the uh, book model, this, this one here, even, it allows you to communicate easily with Swedes and Danes, okay? We Danes, how many Danes did you raise your hand? <laughs> we were there for five, 500 years in Norway, so we taught them a lot of vocabulary before they kicked us out. That's another part of history. But anyway, we influenced the Norwegian language to a great deal, the book model, okay? That's, you could consider that to be the, the literary language. About 70%, 75% speak book model. But the interesting one for a language researcher is New Norse. Okay, New Norse was an attempt in the 19th century to go back to their Viking roots, their Old Norse roots. Norway is a, one of these unique countries where in the old days, even the 19th century, the only way you could get someplace was with, by boat. You had this rugged coastline and all these fjords and everything. So what happened was, you had many, many isolated villages, okay? Some of them for hundreds of years. And so they developed their own dialects, usually derived from Old Norse, okay? So for a linguist, book model is interesting because you can communicate with more Scandinavians with it, but New Norse takes you right back to Old Norse, okay? And that's because of the relative isolation they had, okay? They have many, many different dialects. Some of them don't even understand each other because they were so long in one area. And I'll give you a couple examples. Now, look how easy this is. I used to think Spanish was the easiest language for an American to learn. I don't believe it anymore. I think it's Norse, Norsk, or Norwegian. And this is now uh, English and Old Norse. Now, we're not even talking about Norwegian yet. We're talking Old Norse, okay. Husbund, house. Bound, bound to the house, or house former. Okay, if, if you're a former, this indicates something about the culture too. They don't say house warrior, they say house former. Okay, so that kind of indicates this was their occupation. Husband, so you husbands are farmers that had to stay at home. <laughs> you didn't go on Viking raids, okay? And then we have a lot of other ones that should be familiar to us. Eple is Norse. Book, Norse, Old Norse, Not, Good Not, Good Not, it almost sounds like Good Night, Stein almost sounds like Stone, and then you got this uh, unique characters, Th, Dach. Okay, the thong, this first one, it kind of looks like a P, but it's really thong. It's two, two uh, letters combined in one. Um, thong, thorn, we have the word thorn. Okay, if you look at other Germanic languages, thorn becomes dorn in German. But it's really this D sound, but THD sound. Okay, so once you learn a few of these rules, so this one here is that, 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 that I know. It actually, okay, dog, okay, at kveldi, okay, at is, is really, at, is really at, at the evening, okay. Ilum, ill, we have the word ill, or bad, okay. Sama, in Norwegian, the E is pronounced ar. Jeg ar norsk, I am Norwegian, ar. In the other languages, they, they say er, okay. But anyway, sama, the same as, okay. Go, good, off. Often, oft. We even use this in a lot of the church songs. Seems like they use the word oft instead of. Okay, here's the word bera. Remember? Bera sark. Wear the shirt. Berserk. Okay, that's the word bera, to wear or to bear. Grave, well, that's a little bit farther off. Grave. Aller, all or every. Here's one that's a perfect cognate. A cognate is a word that's exactly the same in both languages, and the best is the cognate. Smitha, smitha. Smitha is a verb, but it's our word for smith. You know, like the, the guy that beats the horseshoes. Okay. Anyway, 
Uh, there's a lot of examples of this. Now this is still Old Norse. And you could go through this. Betra, almost sounds like better. Okay. Better the fourth one down, better are loan. Okay. Loan is to lend. Our word loan, same word. Better. Okay. Blinde buklos, mother. That's way down there. Okay. Better er buklos. Okay. Anyway, booklos, los is bookless. Some of you students are not bookless. You have a lot of books, and they're not cheap. <laughs> so, but bookless was without books. Okay, we even have one English word that's related to it. Vidlos. What do you think that means? Raise your hands if you know. Tu, tu a vidlos. You are witless. Witless. Okay, we have the word witless. It's kind of old. Fashion English. Okay. Anyway, there are the last ones here. Fell a tree. To, to fell a tree. You, you get the gist. There's, there's a lot of old Norse words that are almost the same. Some of them are pure cognates. Okay, I could do more and more. Okay. This is a key book. All Asian students, pay attention. Okay. This guy. Snurra. Snurra Sturluson. He's the one that everybody thought this is this major book of his called the Heims, Heimskringle, the circle of the world. world. <laughs> and we Danes and, and Norwegians know about Kringle. That's our, that's our, <laughs> that's our little uh, wreath that we have. At, uh, we have it almost every week at our Danish church. Okay, because I have to buy it. Okay, but it's, it's just a big, it looks like a Huge donut with pecans on it, okay? Kringle, circle, okay? Heims Kringle, circle of the world. So there's another word, it's, it's really Danish, but we know what it is. But he wrote this book, and he described the entire history of the Norwegians, and this is totally related. This is an important work, okay? Now everybody thought this was mythology at the time. I mean, at the time in, until the last few decades, okay? But he talks about Odin, and he talks about the origins, kings of Scandinavia, 70 BC, that's not too long ago. In Asalan, he calls them Esir. Esir sounds almost like Asians, okay? There, there is a minority religion in Iceland called the Asatu. Asatu. Now these are pagans. It's 1% of the Icelandic population. Okay, and they still practice these, this religion, Asatu, and it's derived from this Asalan or Asahain. And it's uh, Taneus, okay? Where is Taneus? The Greeks were all over here, by the way. They documented all this stuff, okay? So here it is up here, on the River Don. Now we're talking Russia, okay? We're talking all quiet on the Don. I'm sure if you ever read that, I had to read it. Okay, that's the Black Sea. Okay, this explains a lot. Now this was well documented uh, by the Greeks. They, had a, they were there, there were Greek populations up there too. So Odin was supposedly, came from this area. This is all recorded as mythology, but it turns out that uh, that the DNA research in recent years is corroborating this, that the Asians, the, Asians, the, the Nordic peoples did originate in Asia. Okay, we talked a little bit about that in the first hour. Not only the DNA that they performed on human bones and teeth, teeth are great for doing DNA, they don't decompose very rapidly. The Chinese found, I think it was 13, uh, completely preserved skeletons with Western European origin, just within the last couple of years, okay? But not only human DNA, but the horses. Horse DNA, can you believe that? Those little Icelandic horses are purebred. 
And it's very interesting because they came from the steppes of Asia, the Scythians. If you really want to go back to history, this is beyond my comprehension, but that's what I've been told. The Scythians were these nomadic raiders that rode to horses in the steppes that we're talking about. They're part of uh, Black Sea in Russia, okay? And the interesting thing about the Icelanders is they're a perfect uh, population for doing DNA studies because they were isolated so long, okay, that their DNA is, is, is less mixed than other populations. And that includes the horses. Because when I was there in Iceland, they said you can't bring a horse in Iceland and interbreed it with their horses. They have horses that are purebred since 846 AD. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know if this uh, fits in, but um, I had a friend from Hungary, yeah. and his name was Attila. And I thought, that's strange because you think of Attila the Hun. And he told me that historically the Mongols came into, they went south into Hungary, and they went north up into Finland. Right, that's true. And linguistically, you can demonstrate that as well as DNA. Now, that was a later, well, that was a development around, I remember Atla the Hun raided uh, Worms, Germany in 426 AD. They make a big deal in the museum there, you know. And it was the combined armies of the Romans and the Germanic tribes that drove them off at that time. But that's exactly right. Their language is, is uh, Urgic, you know, the same as uh, Hungarian, and, and that's the basis of Finnish. So we'll talk about, in the last hour, going to a university in Scandinavia. If you want to go to Finland, it's a lot harder to learn that language than it is a Scandinavian language. Okay. But they do have some almost free universities there, too. So anyway, yeah, DNA supports what you said, and also linguistic studies. That, that's well known about the Finns and the Urgic uh, Mongolian language. That's where it's derived from. Okay. Now then, okay, I talked about the horses from Mongolia, and that's when they migrated the humans out. And if you, this is my own chart, just to show one example of a haplogroup. That's what they call this stuff, uh, a, gen a, a group of your, your genes that typifies a certain uh, population. Now, the interesting thing is in in North America, the North American Indians have A, B, C, D. Yes. Oh, five minutes already? Oh my gosh, okay. Let's see. Well, anyway, this is an important chart. This is a good one to end it on. Uh, it supports these linguistic studies. Uh, they have encountered X. X is a Central Asian uh, haplogroup. <coughs> And that supports this theory of this migration, and also this ancient skald, Sture Sturluson, who wrote, wrote about the origins of these Nordic people. So this X thing appearing, okay, is evidence of that. Now here's, here's the other thing, I talked about this earlier in the first hour. You got the C1E, well that's North American Indian, in Iceland. Well it's a very isolated village, but there's about 80 individuals today with a lineage going back to a North American lineage in a little isolated village in Iceland. And the sagas talk about this. There's 800, 700, 700 or 800 sagas. They documented their history well. They're, they're, like, they're like the Jews, the Hebrews. You know, they read the Old Testament. They got everybody, they got the lineage of everybody in the Old Testament. Well, Icelanders were like that too, okay? They document everybody's lineage from the beginning they're the only nation in the world that has a complete genealogical database. Let's put it that way. It's amazing. They've got a big history museum there. Okay, that's, I'm running out of time, I know. Okay, but anyway, this is I. Hopla group I. Okay, this starts in the Middle East, and actually it starts in, in uh, 60,000 years ago, it starts in Africa. But anyway, it was, it was a small concentration, but it kept on building up as they went to Iceland. Okay. That is the Icelandic unique uh, haplogroup, high percentage of I, okay? So this is your primary tool if you want to do more research. Here's, here's a bunch of references. Hey, guess what? I'm in time. The next session will be higher education in, in uh, Scandinavia. I'll talk about some of the 
educational opportunities. But once again, there's so much material here. Let me know if you want, to, if you want this PDF file. Okay, questions? Anybody else? I know some of you have to go to class.